Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Rougarou Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Polina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Coastman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 437 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined, as ever, by former heavyweight world title challenger, Mr. Fast Eddie Chambers. Eddie, how you doing this week, sir? I'm doing great, my man. How you feeling? Always good when speaking with you, Eddie. We're going to dive straight into the review part. We're going to start in Tokyo, Japan, at the Kokagikan. If that is even how it's pronounced, I don't know. But anyway, let's start with the undercard. We saw Takuma Inoue, 18-1, and one, the brother of Naoya. He's now 19-1. and one. A KO for him in round nine against Jerwin Ancahas, former world champion, now 34-4 and four with two draws. Ancahas had a little bit of success early on, but then, yeah, Inoue... You know, the body shots became a factor. Managed to get the stoppage in round nine there for the WBA Bantamweight World title. Also on the card, we saw Alexandro Santiago. He's now 28 and 4 with uh with with five draws. Um let me just double check that because something doesn't sound right there. For some reason, I don't feel like he he uh yeah, no, that is right. Yeah, twenty-eight and four, the record now. The first time ever he's been stopped. He was stopped in round six by Junto Nakatani. Now twenty-seven and zero. Now a three-weight world champion. He's such a fantastic fighter, Nakatani. I think that win there, um, you know, I think is is going to probably get him in the conversation now for pound for pound top ten type of, you know, uh, well, type of fighter. I think I think now he's probably he's probably edged his way into a few people's top ten lists. You know, Santiago's been in there with some good fighters. Gary Antonio Russell, um amongst others, and and like I say, was a world champion. Uh been in there with Nonito Donaire, obviously beat him last time out, probably the best win of his career. Um and yeah, like I say, he 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 was stopped there for the first time. Junto Nakatani looked brilliant. Um and yeah, also on the card, Kosi Tanaka now twenty and one, a unanimous decision over twelve rounds for the vacant WBO World Super Flyweight title against Christian Rangel of Mexico. Now twenty two and five with two draws. Um didn't see the Tanaka fight, but anyway, moving on. Let's move now to Poland over here. It took place at the Opera E Philharmonia Podlaska. Over here, Camille Serometa, former opponent of Triple G, he's now 25 and two with two draws. He, he he managed to go ten rounds and get a split draw with Abel Mina, who's now 17 and three with a draw. He racked up his first draw. That one was for the vacant Republic of Poland international super middleweight title, which is still vacant. Also on the undercard, former opponent of Sam Eggington, Prism Slaw Zisk, now eight, uh, now 19-2, and two, a unanimous decision for him over eight rounds against Kamal Urbanski, now 3-2, and two, and former world champion Christoph Vladarczyk, now 65-4 and four with a draw. It was his 70th pro fight. He, he managed to get a unanimous decision over eight rounds at Cruiserweight against Pablo Villanueva, now 12-5 and five with a draw. Didn't see any of that card. Moving now to the Olympia Liverpool Merseyside United Kingdom. This one was on the zone. Um, friend of the show... Jay Harris, he he managed to get in there. He was the slight favourite. He's now twenty one and three, and it seems like he's in a good patch again in his career. Seems like there's a bit of momentum now because he managed to get the the unanimous decision over twelve rounds, and it, and he takes away the O from Connor Butler now eleven and one with a draw. It was for the EBU European 
and also the British and Commonwealth flyweight titles. So that's a massive win there for Jay Harris, particularly at this stage of his career. I think there was a point a couple of years ago where he was thinking about packing it all in. And that, like I say, is the kind of win that you need for you know, for you to turn around your career, which I think he now has done. Really happy for him. It was a fantastic fight as well, by the way. Credit to both men there. Hats off to both guys. Um, moving now to the Carib Royale Orlando in Florida, USA. This one, again, was live on the zone. Eddie Hearn show, match on boxing, of course. I'm going to touch on the undercard first. Um... What did we have? Andy Cruz. A lot of people felt he was definitely going to stop this guy here, Brian Rodriguez, who'd never previously been stopped. He's now 14 and 3. Tough guy. Showed his toughness in there. Um, quite fit, quite strong. Could hold a punch. Um, you know, Andy Cruz, obviously, that super, super talented Cuban Um yeah, he's now only got one KO in his three wins. But again, people were just like, yeah, he's going to get in there. He's going to outclass this Mexican uh, who who was a southpaw, by the way. And, um, and yeah, not often do we see two people get in the ring together. One's Cuban, but he's orthodox and he he's not the southpaw in the fight. That doesn't often happen. But anyway, went the distance, banks another 10 rounds. Um, but yeah, I think some people are disappointed just because they're expecting Andy Cruz to just blow everyone out because of that that amateur success he had. Um, but yeah, like I say, get some experience there. Credit to Rodriguez, who um, yeah had to weather a few storms but managed to hear the final bell. And um, and yeah, it still doesn't get stopped. Also on the card as well, Shakram Giasov with a little bit of an underwhelming performance. He's now 15-0, and 0, so he's still undefeated, but... Yeah, again, people thought he'd blast Pablo Cesar Cano out of there, considering Cano at this point of his career is pretty much done. I think he's got one foot out the door. But anyway, GSOF didn't look all that good, to be honest with you. Um, seemed to just coast um, through the fight, you know. I think he lost a couple of rounds in there as well, but he just didn't look great. It wasn't really the performance that I think everyone expected of him. It wasn't the statement that he wanted to make. In the end, a technical decision in round 11 because Pablo Cesar Cano injured his ankle um, after a clinch and didn't come out for round 12. So it went to the cards and GSO have got it 15-0. and Cesar Cano now 35-9 and with a draw. Also on the card, the main event, Edgar Belanga now 22-0. and A KO for him in round 6 against Podrag McCrory now 18-1. and Um... Like I say, Belanga 22-0. and Happy for him, happy for him, because obviously, like we said on last week's show, this guy was banging everyone out in one round, and then he goes the distance five times in a row. He got dropped in that time. Seemed like he just wasn't the same fighter, but to be honest with you, he got in with Podrag McCrory, who is probably one of the best guys he's actually been in with. I'd say McCrory is probably better than Jason Quigley, probably better than Roma Alexis Angulo, probably better than Steve Rolls, and... Yeah, they're the guys he's been going the distance with recently. Um, probably better than Damon Nicholson as well, who was the first man to take in the distance. But anyway, all of that aside, um, a good performance. A good performance from Belanga. Like I say, he came out in the first round. I think McCrory picked up the first round because Belanga didn't do too much. But as the rounds went on, he seemed to grow in confidence. And McCrory was a little bit negative at times. I think he kind of gave up space a bit too easy for Belanga. And once that happened, it kind of set the tone for how the fight was going to go. Belanga was quite happy to let go of that right hand. You know, that powerful shot that he likes to put out. And um, when he did, I mean, it, it did damage. I think McCrory took a few of them quite you know, quite well when he took them flush. But then they, they it did start to catch up with him, basically. And when he took a few too many they were starting to hurt him every time and he, he wasn't very good at hiding it. You know, the legs would kind of, you know, they they dip, the, the knees would buckle a little bit. I, d I don't think Belanga always noticed actually when it happened, but you could see at home, like you're watching it on TV because you could clearly see he was bothered by a shot there. And, and, and you know, Belanga, when he did put his foot on the gas, he managed to get the stoppage, and it was a great shot, actually, that put Podreg down. Fantastic shot, and a really good knockout in the end for Belanga. So, happy for him, like I say. Back to back to knockout ways, not winning ways, because obviously he's still undefeated, but back to knockouts. And will we see another 16 in a row? I'm not so sure about that, but, you know, 
it's good for him. It's good for him to get a stoppage here. Podreg was a good fighter, a good puncher, and I could see as well, you know, Belanga had a lot of respect for him, um, you know, and, and, and that was it, you know, that, that was it really. There's not too much more to say about it. They're talking about Belanga getting in with Canelo. I think that would be a horrific mismatch, and just for what it's worth, I'm going to throw my two pence in and say that I think Belanga would really struggle with a few people, you know, like pure boxer type of fighters. I think Demetrius Andrade would cause him all kinds of trouble, um, even at 168, which obviously I've said before, I don't think Andrade should really be up at 168, but I think he cause Belanga heaps and heaps of trouble. I also think Caleb Plant would, would absolutely annihilate Belanga. I think styles make fights, but I think anyone who's a pure boxer who can really box, I think they're going to give Belanga serious trouble. Anyone that wants to bang it out with Belanga, maybe that'll work into his hands. But yeah, the Canelo fight is a complete mismatch. It's not a fight I want to see. Um, I'm trying to think of someone that I would like to see Belanga in with. Uh, maybe like a Mungia. I think that'd be a great fight, but I think Mungia would win. I think Belanga's quite limited, but yeah, you know, I think he does put some bums on seats. And people are excited because he can punch, that's for sure. But it's good, like I say, to see him back with another knockout. And I think he'll grow in confidence from that. Um, that actually brings the review part to a close. There wasn't too much to go over. So that's that. It's now time to welcome this week's special guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the former WBO heavyweight champion of the world. It is, of course, my good friend, Mr. Joseph Parker. Joseph, welcome back on the show. Thanks for having me on, as always. Hey, it's always my pleasure, Joe. So we last spoke back in November. At the time, you'd just beaten Simon Keane. I was complimenting your performance. I said it was the best you'd looked in a long time. Uh, it was starting to really look like a fabulous partnership with Andy Lee. It was finally in full flow. What I did not expect was you to be fighting anyone too good of a fighter just six weeks later. You gave me a couple of names. Um, I don't think Wilder was one of them. But how wrong I was. I mean, a massive fight. Before we get to it... It. You flew from Saudi uh, to New Zealand, obviously, after the Keane fight. How much travelling did you do around that period? Because six weeks to prepare for Wilder isn't usually enough at the best of times without the crazy long-haul flights and the fact you just had another fight. <laughs> yeah, listen, do you know when you, when you put it like that, it wasn't the longest time, but because I was already in good shape and I've just come off a, a good camp and a good win, I spent a week and a half back home in New Zealand with my wife and kids Got the phone call saying there was a few options of, I think uh, Zhang was an option, there was a few other options, and then they said, oh, Daniel Dubois was an option, then they said, like, like, oh, sorry, we don't think uh, that's an option, I think uh, Wilder's looking for an opponent, do you, do you want to take the Wilder fight? So one thing led to the next, I called Andy, Andy agreed, I agreed, and then next week, like two or three days later, I was on an airplane flying to Ireland, flying from New Zealand to Dubai to Ireland to start a six-week camp. Uh, for that fight. So it wasn't a longer time, but I was already in shape and I had good momentum in camp. Just finished with a good win and on to the next fight. But it was a big, big fight. It was mega. And Joe, please put into words that unbelievable performance, obviously beating Wilder just before Christmas. Um, you didn't really take a right hand all night. You ducked underneath it pretty much every time. The, the game plan seemed to be absolutely flawless. You know, when, you came, when we came off of a game plan, we practiced it and we executed it in, in training and inspiring. And, you know, it was, uh, was crucial. You know, I, I did three weeks in Ireland and I trained very hard, sparred with a lot of top guys there. Then I flew to England for a week and sparred Tyson and, and got his views on what we should be doing. And him and Andy came up with a game plan. Then we came to Saudi Arabia for two weeks before the fight and sparred with Lawrence Coley. And uh, we did some great training. And then the week of the fight, Andy and I met at the gym. And uh, he says to me, Joe, I think we have to fight fire with fire. I said, what do you mean? He said, when he throws the right hand, you have to throw yours. And I said, Andy, crazy thing is, I was just been thinking the same thing. And then we started working on this uh, countering as soon as he threw his right hand, throwing ours. And um, it's incredible. It's incredible to go out there in, in, in the ring and to execute a plan that we've been working on, um, obviously throughout the whole camp and in fight week. And uh, putting on a good performance was, was the best performance of my career. And there's a lot of credit goes to the team. Andy Lee, George Lockhart for all their hard work and then obviously myself putting in the work and just training very hard every day. It was good. It was very good. 
It's the most happiest I've been watching a fight for as long as I can remember. I was screaming at the TV every time you had success. Um, yeah, you know, obviously you went in as the underdog. You were, you were really, you know, kind of viewed as a stepping stone for us to finally see Joshua Wilder. You tore up the script. You upset the odds. Where does that win rank amongst all of your wins? Does it top, you know, the Ruiz fight for the world title? Or? You know, winning the world title is the best feeling ever because that's what every every fighter wants to be champion of the world. But I think at that, at this time and and beating Wilder and knowing what Wilder has done to all the other fighters um, and being able to you know like you said coming in as a, the underdog and, and and sort of ripping up the script, I think this tops them because of the and also because of the the, the audience. You know, everyone that was watching and it was just it was good. It was a good performance and I I went home celebrated with the family had two weeks off and then I'm sure I was straight back into camp again. Yeah, no, for sure. But yeah, like I say, just I cannot stop talking about how great a win that was. Um, my last real question on that fight, you did seem to tire a little bit late on in the fight. Um, I was worried because in those last two rounds, Wilder started to get desperate. And as we know, when he's desperate, he's even more dangerous than when he's actually thinking about things. Um, yeah, just talk to me about that. Was it was... I mean, how did you feel in those last couple rounds? Not, not so much tired. I just uh, Andy always uh, in the corner, just just uh, reiterated how how important it was to stay focused and not get too careless. And also, you know, just your eyes you always had to be open and, and be aware of what was coming back. And um, he did try, put, like Andy did say to me the last two rounds, he's going to try to put it on you and get a knockout. And um, I was always very cautious, and I was always very. I was prepared for whatever he, he came with. And he didn't listen. He landed a few shots, but he didn't land anything clean. It would have been a different story. Uh, but he does punch very hard. I caught I caught a few right hands on the gloves, and I thought, you know what? This guy can punch very, very hard. Yeah, for sure, my man. And, yeah, I was going to ask, where are you now? But I know you're you're in Saudi. Um, yeah, who's out there? Because I didn't, I didn't know that you were there. I thought you'd be in Ireland. Uh, I'm, in, I'm in Saudi Arabia with Andy Lee. George Lockhart and just uh, my massage therapist and my brother, and we're here to prepare for the the big fight we have with Zhang on the eighth of March on the undercard of uh, Joshua versus Ngannou. Yeah, so you got there pretty early, okay. Um, but yeah, let's look forward to that. Let's look ahead. Not long to go now, as you said, March the eighth, back in your new adopted home. Um, you'll be boxing Zhili Zhang, obviously. Joe Joyce stopped you in the past. Zhang stopped Joyce twice. If you beat Zhang, does that diminish your loss to Joyce slightly, maybe? I think it does. Oh, hey, listen, uh, styles and boxing styles do make fights, and everyone has their great days uh, on fight night, and everyone has their bad days on fight night. And like you said, I did lose to Joe Joyce, but I've, I've come a long way since then, and He's had two tough fights with Zhang, and Zhang is coming in with full confidence into this fight because of the work that he's done with Joyce and seeing what Joyce done to me. So it's one of those fights where, again, I'm the underdog, but we are putting in the work we need to put in to, to be the best prepared for Zhang and the best Zhang that's going to come on fight night. And yeah, I had one, not even 100% confidence, but 200% confidence that Joyce would beat Zhang. I felt Zhang was tailor-made for Joyce. Big, slow, you know, not as tough as Joyce. And I was made to look an absolute fool on both occasions. You were obviously the underdog, like you said, again, um, just like you were against Wilder. Stylistically, without giving too much away, how do you see this fight playing out? I think it's going to steal the show. I feel, you know, with Zhang, he's, uh, he fights, like, he's, listen, he's a power puncher, as we can see, with the work that he's done with Joe Joyce, but also in the other fights, you know, and um, he used to tire in a lot of his fights, whereas we see now, as recent times, he doesn't really tire as much, maybe he's found his magic weight, maybe he's found uh, the right conditioning, maybe he's found the right, you know, box, I don't know what it is, but he's changed a few things where we've seen a lot of improvements, and with Zhang, I feel like you just have to, you have to be very smart with him, same as Wilder, you have to box and move, and um, he fights in spurts, as Zhang does. And he listen, he's very sharp. So it's, it's going to be a, a challenge, but it's a challenge I'm looking forward to. Yeah, you're right. He did used to tire like crazy after a couple of rounds, and he seemed to kind of, yeah, just fiddle his way, you know, more and more rounds as they come fighting in spurts um you know you've got a much much quicker feet the much quicker hands i feel like you're going to cause major problems for zhang I, I also think obviously you've got a fantastic chin that will stand up to his power 
if you're caught in that situation, you don't want to be there too many times. Um, I'm very confident you're going to Not upset the odds here, Joe. Well, listen, you know, Zhang, I have, I, I, um, I heard in an interview, like I did say that I fought Zhang as an amateur back when I was about 20 years old. Oh, I didn't know. And Zhang was about, what, 28, 29 years old. And I do remember he was just a big man. Um, a lot has changed since then. And uh, I just feel um, like, like you said, Zhang did tie in the past, but maybe he's found the right people now and the right training and the right formula that works for him. And I feel like I've found. I've found what works for me now. I got Andy Lee as a head trainer. I got George Lockhart doing nutrition, strength and conditioning, recovery, and I feel like now everything is more balanced in my training and in my schedule. That I can that now I'm going to fights. So I'm not overtrained. I'm not tired, and I'm full of energy, ready to rock and roll. And who who won that fight in the amateurs, Joe? Zhang won. Zhang beat me uh, four or five points, whatever it was. But it was a long, long time ago. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a different time because at that time I had no, no proper trainer, no nutrition, no, you know, no guidance. Whereas now I have everything that I need. So there's no, no excuses. There's no worries. There's no, um, there's no like, I'm not nervous or anything. I just, I'm just eager to get in there and uh, get to work. And you've obviously been a champion, Joe. Um, are these the kinds of fights that, even if they aren't for a world title, still whet your appetite to the fullest? Obviously, we've seen you in massive fights with the likes of Dillian White, the two with Chisora. You know, you, you're, you're having massive fights with Wilder. No titles on the line, but th- th- you still, you're still able to get up for them. These are these are the fights that I get up for. These are the fights that um, you know that push me in training. Like when it's a big challenge, challenging fight, and when it's a fight where the odds are against you, it's like, oh, you want to push that much harder, you want to train that much harder, and you want to just do everything right because these fights are the ones that make you like excited and, and get you amped up. And I'm, I'm I'm really amped up for this fight. And and how do you see the main event going? By the way, Joshua and Garnu. In my view, people are getting a little bit too carried away with how well and Garnu seem to do against Fury. Obviously, you said it earlier on. Styles make fights. It doesn't necessarily mean this will be a super competitive fight. But what do you think? I feel that Joshua, being this is this is what he does. He boxes, you know, his whole life. Whereas Ngannou is not. It's not the first sport that he chose, but he has been training for the longest time, and he's put in some great work. And like we saw with, with Tyson, it was it was an off night for Tyson, and it was a great night for Ngannou. And just what this fight is like, it's an interesting fight because they like Ngannou can take a big shot, he can like he can take elbows and kicks, and he can take punches. So it's uh, we haven't really seen him hurt. So it'll be interesting to see if Joshua can hurt and guard in this fight with the power that he possesses. Yeah, and also that 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 nagging question, you know, if Joshua is lacking confidence and things get hairy, gets caught with a big shot, things are going to get very interesting very quickly. Um, just before we let you go, Joe, if you've got any closing words to the listeners, like I say, always great to have you back on. I think we've been we've been doing these interviews since the Takam fight, if my memory serves me. <laughs> That was a, what, it was a 2016, a long, long time ago. But just um, before I leave, I just want to say, let's appreciate everyone that always tunes in to support the boxing, to support uh, your channel, to support everyone that's involved in the sport. And we keep being involved in the big fights. And, and uh, we'd love just to put the best fights we can on for those those that are watching and those who are supporting us. So thank you all for the support and for the love. Tune in for a major fight card that's going to be exciting and I'll talk to you guys very soon. Absolutely. Listen, Joe, we love you as a man. You're a super cool guy. We love you as a fighter. It's clear that you will fight absolutely anyone. You've proven it time and time again. As always, the pleasure's mine. Thank you for your time. Best of luck on the 8th and we'll speak soon sometime afterwards. Speak soon, brother. Thank you very much, Joey. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the news part of the show, but nothing to bring you for it. Same as last week, it seems like at this point in the year, there doesn't seem to be too much news going on in boxing, or at least not, you know, 
mentionable news. There's nothing really massive going on. But anyway, let's dive straight into the review part. Then we're going to start tomorrow, the 1st of March. It just seems like this year is flying by, but it's Friday, the 1st of March. It's at the Telford International Centre in Telford, Shropshire, United Kingdom. Let's talk about the undercard. Firstly, we're going to see friend of the show, Elliot Wow, 8-0 with four KOs. He's back in a six-rounder against Fernando Mosquera, who's six and fifteen. All the best there to Elliot Wow. Also on the card, we're going to see return to the ring for heavyweight Matty Harris. It's the first time that he is back in the ring since losing by knockout to Konstantin Dovbichenko last time out. That was a massive upset. He gets in with Amin Bouchetta, who's ten, sorry, eight and ten. Um, only been stopped twice, though. Been in there with Moses Itama. Got stopped in a round by him. Went the distance, though, with Tommy Welch. Went the distance with Scott Forrest. Uh, went the distance with everyone else apart from Arta Mann, who got him out in round four. So, yeah, he's a, he's a durable guy, tough guy. Uh, so all the best there to Matty Harris. Uh, what else do we have on that card? We're going to see Sultan Zorbeck as well, 16-0. and 0. Uh, It's an eight-rounder there at Super Featherweight. He is... A fighter that I think was previously with MTK, he's from Kazakhstan, he's a 27-year-old Southpaw. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, was a decent amateur. But yeah, he's 16-0 and with 12 KOs. He gets in there with Victor Julio, who is 17-10. and And um, Victor Julio boxed Archie Sharp in December. In December, I was at that fight, went the distance with Archie Sharp. Uh, but yeah, he was coming off like something mad, like nine losses in a row. He did, though, win a fight in in, in January. He beat a guy called Jose Flores, who was Norton 13. He knocked him out in two rounds. So finally, he's back to winning ways here, Mr. Victor Julio. <laughs> um, and yeah, the main event should be a really interesting fight. I think it's going to be very, very interesting. A Bas Barrao, 14-1. It's for the vacant EBU European Super Welterweight title. He gets in the ring with Sam Eggington, 34 and 8. Very interesting because obviously, Sam, we had him on the show uh, a few weeks ago now in, in, you know, in the build up to this fight. And he said at the time that, you know, the, the book is, you know, I'm the underdog. And I remember looking at the odds and seeing that they were both exactly the same price. They were both just underneath even. So I was one. I was kind of thinking, what are you talking about, Sam? Because you're not the underdog. You're both exactly the same price. Well, now, boy, oh boy, oh boy, Abbas Barrow has gone into a massive favorite. He's one to three on, and Sam Eggington is 12 to five. So, that is a mad price there on Sam Eggington. I think he's worth a shot, particularly because it's in the UK. Obviously, he's got that very fan-friendly style, very eye-catching. He can win a round big, but then I guess at times we've seen him lose a round big when he just gets outboxed. Um, but I do think... You know, Sam Eggington is is in probably the form of his career. He, he looked fantastic last time out against Joe Pigford. I think Sam himself kind of undermined that performance a little bit for some reason. Um, I think it was a brilliant win against Joe Pigford. He looked fantastic. Obviously, he's been out the ring a little bit. I think it would have been great to see him back a bit sooner than this. He's had to wait a long time. There's been dates falling through and stuff. But very excited to see him back. Um not that it matters too much, but the box rec rankings have got Sam Eggington quite a bit higher than Abbas Barrow. Um, Barrow's another guy that I think they expected big things of when he turned pro. Obviously took a bit of a shock loss at one point and he's back here. Still kind of rebuilding, but... I just don't understand why he's that big of a favourite. I think Sam Eggington is well worth a shot on points at the price of 15 to 4, so almost 4 to 1 on points. Or even if you're feeling ballsy, you could go with the stoppage in the second half of the fight at 18 to 1. I mean, that's insane. That is insane. We've seen what Sam Eggington can do when he overwhelms opponents. This could be that, you know. I don't think Abbas Barrow is going to have the, you know, the firepower to keep him off, but. Will he be able to box smart behind the jab? We'll have to wait and see. Very intriguing fight, though. I would not at all count the savage Sam Eggington out of this fight here. All the best to him. Would love to see him do it. 
It'd be massive for him as well to become a two-weight European champion. Moving now to Kozelin in Poland. Over here, we're going to see a guy that I'd never heard of before. His name is Kaspar Mayner. He's 11-1, this guy here. It's for the vacant Republic of Poland heavyweight title. But he gets in with friend of the show. He's in horrific form right now. Adam Kalnacki. Um, he's, he's currently 20-4, Kalnacki. Um, obviously, you know, we talked about it last time when he boxed. We actually said it on the podcast. It's worth a little bet on Joe Cusamano stopping him. I think that was big odds. A lot of our listeners listened to that and jumped on it and won some money. But he's coming off four losses in a row, Adam Kalnacki, after winning 20 in a row. He seems to be in terrible, terrible form. Obviously got knocked out by Cusamano. Lost on points to Alier and Demarism before that. And then the two back-to-back stoppages to Robert Helania. So he gets in there with this guy, Kasper Mayner, who I don't know too much about. He's 11-1. and one. He's got seven KOs. Um, looking at his record, some of the wins, I don't really recognize anyone there. But it seems like Kalnaki is in the away corner, if I'm not mistaken. I will note, though, that this guy, Kasper Mayner, is not really a big guy. He's only six foot one and a half. He's 24 years of age, though, so very much got the youth on his side. I personally felt that Kaunaki was going to retire after that loss to Joe Cusimano, but obviously he's back. And, um, yeah, he's not a massive heavyweight himself, but he will actually be the, the taller guy of the two. Anyway, that's it. All the best there to Adam Kaunaki. He's the friend of the show. I'd love to see him win here, but... Again, it'd be interesting to see the odds on on the upset. Um, yeah, moving now to the Coliseo, Jose Miguel Agrilo in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Over here, it's going to be live on the zone. We're going to see headlining the main event. Let's start there. Amanda Serrano, uh, an unbelievable fighter, massive fan of hers. Forty six and two with a draw. She's back in Puerto Rico, her hometown, her home country her home nation, and she's back for the biggest, well, I say the biggest fight of her career, that would be really telling a lie, but, you know, it's a big 50, it's her 50th pro fight, which is amazing, so she's back home for it, massive celebrations, it's for her IBF, IBO, WBA, and WBO featherweight world titles, um, And yeah, she's in a 12-rounder here as well. It's sad, but the WBC, if I'm not mistaken, didn't want her to fight in 12 rounds, so decided to maybe not sanction the bout or maybe strip her. I can't remember. But anyway, she's she's in a 12-rounder here against Nina Mink, who we've seen a few times, Nina Mink. She's 18-3. and three. The one time she got stopped was to Katie Taylor back in 2017. Since then, she's kind of... You know, she's boxed some decent fighters. She's, I wouldn't say she's a journey woman, because obviously she's only got the three losses, but she hasn't really beaten anyone fantastic, and I'm expecting her to to lose to Amanda Serrano. It's just a case of will Serrano stop her or not. I would probably say not, just because I think Serrano recently, you know, she hasn't really been getting the knockouts. I mean, she's still, I think, tied with the most knockouts in women bo- in women's boxing history, if I'm not mistaken. I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think her and Christy Martin are both tied on 30 KOs. So, obviously, she, she does get the knockout most of the time. But she's gone the distance in her last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven fights. You've got to go back to March of 2021 for the last time that she knocked someone out. And, pro- and, and, and she was actually coming off three knockouts at that point. So seems like in the last sort of three years, the knockouts have disappeared. But we'll have to wait and see. Nina Minke is a tough girl, but yeah, she's not going to win here. I'd be very surprised if she even racks up two rounds over the 12. And also, on the chief support, we're going to see Jake Paul 8-1 eight and one in, a, in an 8-rounder here at Cruiserweight. He gets in with the relatively unknown Ryan Borland, who's 17-2, and two, who's an inactive Cruiserweight, last boxed in September of 2022. Um, he lost his one... The one time he got knocked out was to Israel Dufus in a round back in 2015. We've seen Dufus over here in the UK. He's certainly a big puncher. Um, but yeah, like I say, you've seen him on the on the losing end to Chev Clark, Fan Long Meng. Um, he's boxed a few other guys, Mikkel, um Sozinski as well. That one went down in York Hall. Um, so yeah, anyway, back to what I was saying, going off track a little bit. But yeah, Ryan Borland hasn't really beaten anyone of note. And he also lost his most recent fight in 2018 to Jose Hernandez. 
um, majority decision, that one over eight rounds. But yeah, he's been very, very inactive because he made his pro debut in October of 2013. So what's that, 10 years and four months ago now? Almost five months ago now? Yeah, 10 years, four months. And um, he's had, what's that, uh, 19 fights. So not even two a year. Uh, he's took big breaks in his career as well. So I'm not sure what the story is with this guy. But yeah, he's a six foot tall, uh, you know, cruiserweight. Um, and yeah, I can't tell you too much more about the guy. I don't even know how old he is or anything like that. But yeah, be interesting, I guess. It's good to see Jake Paul back. And yeah, it's interesting that he's going down in Puerto Rico. Or Puerto Rico, I should be saying. Um, what else do we have for you? Let's move to the the final two cards to mention. This one goes down at the Showboat Hotel in Atlantic City, New Jersey. He's got no opponent yet, but former world champion and friend of the show, Tevin Farmer, 32-5 and five with a draw. Hopefully they sort an opponent for him. It's not long to go now, but he's back in a scheduled eight-rounder at Super Featherweight. All the best to Tevin. He's been very active, actually, in recent times, which is good. Makes a big change for him. And, yeah, the final card to mention goes down at the Turning Stone Resort and Casino in Verona, New York, USA. Let's touch on the undercard first. We're going to see return to the ring for Nico Arley Walsh, who's currently 8-1. and one. Um, He's back in a six-rounder. He gets in with an undefeated fighter here. I'm going to just have a little look at this guy, and he's got a very hard name to pronounce. It's Luke Iannucci, I think. And, yeah, I could be saying that right or wrong. I don't know. But um, 7-0 and with three KOs. Looking at the guys he's beaten, and he has not beaten anyone with a winning record. So it's a little bit padded there. Uh, we'll have to wait and see how that one unfolds. All the best to Nico. Also on the card, friend of the show, Troy Isley, 11-0, gets in the ring with Marcos Hernandez, who's 16-6 and with two draws. Um, yeah, I've seen him before, been in, been in there with a few guys, Anthony Darrell, Alontes Fox, Kevin Newman, Jason Banana, Rosario, uh, Chiron Davis as well. Um, so, yeah. All the best there to Troy Isley, friend of the show. We're also going to see Rohan Polanco, 11-0. He looked fantastic last time out when he beat Keith Hunter, which was sad for me to see because Keith's a friend of the show. But Rohan Polanco, seven KOs from his 11 wins, managed to stop Keith Hunter in slightly controversial circumstances. He gets in with the undefeated 13-0 with one draw. Tarek Zayner, who I've never heard of, but he actually says he's a... United Kingdom national, but he was born in Morocco and lives in Mexico, so I'm not entirely sure how that makes him British, but anyway, all the best to that guy, I guess, um, never heard of him, but all the best to him, also on the card, I'm going to come to you here, Eddie, not that you're probably going to know too much about the, well, yeah, the favourite, in the fight, which is Otabek Kolmatov, who's 12-0 and with 11 KOs, the Uzbek, who's living in Florida these days. But yeah, he is stepping in the ring for the vacant WBA World Featherweight title against America's very own Raymond Ford, who at times has been called the best prospect in world boxing. Some people disagree wholeheartedly with that statement, but they've said he's, he's a very special fighter. 14-0 with one draw. And one thing that you have in common with him is that you're both trained by the same guy. What can you tell me about Raymond Ford? And, of course, best of luck to him this Saturday and Coach Ant that will be with him there in Verona. Yeah, yeah. Um, definitely one of the better prospects and and, and, and talented young guy, 100%. Uh, really, really hard worker. Um, uh, he, he, he loves what he's doing. You know what I mean? Just completely invested mentally. I mean, I talk, me and Ann talk about it all the time. He said he doesn't really, and it really doesn't have to work very hard to get him to do certain things. He's completely, and then he believes in it with his corners telling him he, he's a student of the game. So it's, he's definitely got a lot going for him in a way of that. I mean, obviously this, this guy he's fighting. And, and the funny thing is we've actually been <laughs> periodically. I've went and I've looked over some video of the guy. The guy looks to be pretty solid. Uh, obviously he's, uh, he looks like he's pretty good at range if I'm not mistaken. Um, but, uh, he's, yeah, but raised, it, it, it's like his name is savage, <laughs> but he's just really, really so into it. And so, like I said, so invested, 
his his uh his boxing ability the things he does he, like i said he trains like a maniac he doesn't really have to uh tell him to do many things you know what i mean as far as staying at it so um i think he's going to be i think he's going to be successful in this i think this is going to be his first world title uh but he's definitely going to have to you know really stick to the game plan can't get too uh too ahead of himself and and start thinking about things after this fight cuz this obviously is a huge stepping stone a huge uh, 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 opportunity for him to, like I said, grab a title and put himself in position to, uh, you know, maybe even, you know, move up, unify, different things like that. Uh, uh, it, it just puts him in a different bracket. So I'm hoping uh, that he's got his head all right. He's focused. He's, and I know he's training like he's supposed to, but um, just pump your brakes and make sure you focus on this one, take care of business. And then after that, then we can look at what's next. Yeah, just to reiterate, he's a slight underdog, Ray Ford. So, uh, yeah, good prices on him, really. You can get 2-1 to one for the points win, so triple your money. Or you can get 7-1 to one for the KO, so that would be huge. I do just want to touch on, obviously, his opponent, Otabek Kolmatov. I remember now, I remember seeing him knock out Thomas Patrick Ward and take his O, uh, which was, you know, madness, really. I mean, Thomas Patrick Ward, that's another story for another day, but... Happy to see Raymond Ford get this shot here. I think it's a really good fight because obviously we've got a, a very good amateur who's been pretty much flawless as a pro. Like I said, 12-0 and with 11 KOs and he gets in with Raymond Ford who's such a highly touted prospect who, uh, yeah, obviously announces himself on the world scene here. Um and and yeah, he's been he's been ticking all the right boxes as well, you know. He's been beating some great fighters. I just want to touch on a little statistic here, actually. Raymond Ford in his last four fights. Um I want to combine these records real quick here. Uh yeah, so his last four fights, his opponent's combined record would be 78 wins and two losses. So that speaks for itself. So all the best there to Ray Ford. Um did I want to add something else to that? I can't remember. I think I think that was probably it. But yeah, moving straight then to the main event, and it's the final fight to discuss. I'm not going to go in too much detail here, but we've got Luis Alberto Lopez, 29 and two, always in a fun fight. He's defending here his IBF featherweight world title over 12 rounds against Raya Abe. Luis Alberto Lopez coming off that win last time out against Joet Gonzalez. Prior to that. A little bit of a wrecking ball. I mean, Joet Gonzalez is a tough, tough guy, as we know. But prior to that, knocking out Michael Conlon, um, you know, great, great fight with Josh Warrington in uh, in, in their one, uh, which was close. Uh, knocked out Isaac Lowe a few fights before that. He was just, you know, annihilating everyone. Had a good fight with Andy Ventes, but he's back against Raya Abe, 25-3 and three with a draw. The Southpaw from Japan, 30 years of age, coming off. A nice little run as well himself. You know, he beat Kiko Martinez last time out. That was almost a year ago, so he's been out the ring since then. Um, but yeah, you know, he's 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 a little bit limited. You know, I think Luis Alberto Lopez is, is the big favourite for a reason. Um, so yeah, I'm backing him to win this. But, you know, it could be interesting. But I would probably back him to to maybe become the first man to stop Raya Rape. Um and if it was to be a stoppage, I can kind of see it around the midway point. I don't think that, I don't think that that it's gonna go late this fight. I don't think. I don't think we're gonna see round ten or nothing like that. I think, um, yeah, I think you might get him around about the midway point. But it'd be a statement because he's a tough guy. Been been around the block, like I say, and hasn't ever been stopped. But anyway, it's gonna be a good fight because Luis Alberto Lopez is involved, and it always seems to catch fire when he is involved. And yeah, good to see it as well going down on ESPN. Um, so yeah, should be a good one. It's, it's it's not one of their biggest cards of the year, but again, it's going to be one I'm tuning in for. Obviously, fantastic to have it on Sky here in the UK. But anyway, that brings the show to an end. In part one, we did the review part. Then we welcomed our special guest, my good friend, former WBO heavyweight world champion, Mr. Joseph Parker. Always, always great to have him on the show. And in part two, we did the, well, we didn't do the news. There was nothing to bring you. But then we did the preview part. We've just wrapped that up. It's now time for me to come in with the outro, which I'll do in just a few seconds. 
Okay, and this wraps up episode 437 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been with me for the duration of the show. A huge shout out to this week's special guest, that man being former WBO heavyweight world champion, Mr. Joseph Parker. All the best to him next weekend in Saudi Arabia. Massive fight, cannot wait. The biggest thanks of all though goes out to you, the listeners. Thanks once again, sincerely, for tuning in to this week's podcast and all the other ones that you tune into. Very, very thankful myself and Eddie. That is about everything though from myself. Enjoy your weekends, people. Stay safe and we shall see you all again next week.